this meeting is being recorded. Uh, that the meeting recording, is being recorded. A transcript, uh, the recording and the safe chat will be available as soon as possible after the summit. Please keep your mics muted throughout the presentations. If you're on your computer, click the microphone symbol at the bottom left to mute. If you are calling in, press star six to mute your phone. We might also manually mute you if we notice background noise. If you have questions, please include them in the chat. RTC rural staff will be monitoring these for the discussion portion at the end of the meeting when presenters will have the opportunity to respond. There is closed captioning for today's call provided by Montana Relay. To use closed captioning, you may select CC on your Zoom toolbar. If you are using your phone, this may look a little bit different because of reduced menu space. You may need to tap the more dot 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 button to adjust meeting settings. Today's sessions will include presentation slides and various speakers. You can adjust your view mode by selecting gallery or speaker view in the top right of your Zoom window. Speaker view might be easier to provide the best experience in today's format. Once you are in closed captioning, you can tap your screen once to close the toolbar and make room for more, more room for captions. You can also make speakers larger by selecting the dot, dot, dot on their boxes and pinning them using the push pin icon. And you can adjust the size of the boxes to your preference. If you have any trouble, please send a direct message to Justice Ender in the chat and he can help. And once again, we ask that you please mute your mics to ensure clear communication from our wonderful panel of presenters. And now I'll pass it over to Katherine Ibsen to introduce today's session. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for our first summit presentation on Rural Personal Assistance Services. So I'm Katherine Ibsen. I have had the pleasure of serving as the director of the RTC Rural or the Research and Training Center on Disability in Rural Communities, a big uh, mouthful, for the last four years. So our summits, uh, today's and tomorrow's presentations, reflect the perspectives of many people, including researchers at RTC Rural, but also community partners. Um, and we're excited to share our work alongside these voices of disabled people and personal assistance providers who live and work in rural communities. Uh, before we get started, I want to do a big shout out to Jeff Gutierrez and Justice Ender, who've done all the behind the scenes work to get this going, and our panelists who've contributed to the framing of our discussion and have offered personal insights on the issue of rural personal assistance services. I also want to thank Nidler, uh, who's provided longstanding funding to support the health, employment, and community living goals of rural people with disabilities. Uh, before I get started, I just want to do one last little housekeeping um, item and talk about language and how we talk about people with disabilities. So at RTC Rural, we both use person first, meaning person with a disability, and identity first, things like disabled person, language in our presentations. Our speakers bring their own norms into the discussion. And so please honor the varied voices. Don't get hung up on terminology, but really try to listen and focus in on the messages that people share. Okay, so our summit outline, where are we gonna go today? First, I'm gonna talk briefly about personal assistance services in America and a crisis in the making in terms of availability for people who need those services. I'm gonna, use that frame to pass the baton to Reina, who will really talk about much of the RTC rural research that she has led focusing on this topic. Then this overview will set the stage for a panel of community experts who will offer solution focused ideas about strategies to improve personal assistance services. We want to provide those uh, ideas both from, or well, trice, I don't know, from consumer perspectives, worker perspectives, and systems perspectives, so that you get kind of a, a well-rounded or uh, 
a synergistic view of some of the strategies. Our consumer perspectives will be provided by Greg English and Chris Gaspari. Greg lives in rural Wisconsin and has used a power chair for the last 14 years. He and his wife have self-directed his personal assistance services. Chris lives in rural Nebraska and was injured on the job in November of 2000. She uses a power chair and has used agency-based in-home care for four years. She is an active advocate at the state and local level and provides a unique perspective as a person who both uses as well as advocates for services. Worker perspectives will be provided by Lacey and Gordon and Simone Tatman. Lacey and lives in rural Wisconsin and has worked as one of Greg's aides for the last six years. Before she worked um, for Greg, she also worked in a nursing home and at a hospital medical surgery and ER unit. Simone lives and works in one of the poorest counties in rural Northern California. She's been a caregiver since 2008 and has worked independently and for agencies as well as belonging to a workers union. Our systems perspectives will be provided by Jeff Hughes and Jane Johnson. Jane, or Jane, Jeff, <laughs> has been the director of Progressive Independence, a center for independent living in Oklahoma for the last 30 years. And Progressive Independence serves a large rural service area. And finally, Jane is the executive director of the Florida Association for Centers for Independent Living. Jane has over 20 years of experience in Medicaid home and community-based services policy and programming. So at the conclusion of these presentations, we welcome audience comments and questions. And Justice Ender and Lillian Griman, both with RTC Rural, will be uh, kind of collecting these questions as the presentation goes and summarizing them for our discussion at the end. So as you have questions, please feel free to drop them in the chat. Okay, I get to finally get to the overview. It's always hard getting through the, the intro part. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about personal assistance services. So we're all on the same page about what we're talking about. Personal assistance services are provided to people who require assistance to perform activities of daily living. These things can include such things as cooking, cleaning, bathing, dressing, taking medications, toileting, etc. Personal assistance services support independence and life quality, and they are cost effective relative to nursing home or congregate care settings. So they actually have a positive benefit in terms of cost. They also have positive benefits in terms of values. It allows people to live in their own homes. It allows people to remain close to establish friends and supports, to participate in and contribute to community life. And uh, not a big surprise, people prefer personal assistance services to other assisted living options. Demonstrated in an ARP uh, study in 2021 that found 77% of adults age 50 and older want to remain in their homes over the long term. People want to be in their homes. We there is a converging crisis in terms of personal assistance services in the US, which is shaped by both supply and demand. Now, I come from an economics background, so this is, this is my language. We got supply. Supply is personal care aids, and it's shrinking. Why is supply shrinking? Because wages are low. The average personal a care attendant makes $14.15 an hour, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. There have been lots of exits from the healthcare sector across the whole healthcare sector as a result of COVID. 
So 1.5 million jobs were lost in the healthcare sector in the first two months of COVID. And although there have been rebounds in terms of people coming back into those health sector jobs, they are still below pre-pandemic levels. Uh, a study conducted by Mercer indicated that by 2025, home health and personal care aid shortages will be 446,000 workers. And the, there have been additional and substantial exits due to retirement that are continued to move into the future. So the supply is shrinking. There also is a increased demand. So while supply is going down of workers, there's actually more people in the population that will require care. The aging population is expected to increase from 54 million to 95 million in the next 40 years. 70% of that population is expected to need some basic assistance in the form of personal care. There are increasing rates of disability, both in terms of uh, more disability at a school age level and chronic conditions at school age level, but also an estimated 23 new uh, individuals with dis, uh, disabilities as a result of long COVID. And the projected demand for healthcare workers is expected to grow 25% by 2031, which would require 924,000 new people entering that workforce. Now, I'm gonna just give you a little bit of, um, can you back up, uh, Jeff, just because I'm not quite there yet. So I'm just going to give you a little bit of economic background in terms of, so in a capitalist society, this problem isn't supposed to happen. It's supposed to sort itself out. Uh, demand is always support, supposed to kind of equalize into supply. So higher prices in terms of wages will increase the supply. People will enter the market and people won't demand as many services because of the high prices. These forces do not work well in any type of healthcare, including personal assistance services. So first demand, regardless of price, people rely on PAS to live. Demand does not shrink based on price, only the hardship that people experience due to the lack of those services. In terms of su supply, strategies to increase supply, such as higher wages, are hard to implement. Lags and politics associated with Medicare, Medicaid, insurance programs make reimbursement rates difficult to change. And the convergence of this crisis creates a situation that is dire and is growing more dire with each passing year. So that is the overview of where we are in personal assistance services in America. And now I'm gonna pass the baton on to Raina, who's gonna share experiences of people who are living through this crisis. Before I do that though, in the spirit of positive change, I want to highlight that our panelists will offer personal, environmental, and system strategies that are really meant to both increase supply and minimize demand. So we're not here just to express how awful the situation is, but to really try and focus the conversation into the future. So with that, Raina, take it away. Uh, thank you, Catherine, for that uh, introduction to the super important uh, issue. And I'm going to be spending just a bit of time um, talking about five research projects that we've done over the past four years on this topic before we transition to our panelists with um, their important uh, real lived experiences um, and insights into what we can do to make sure that people want to work these jobs, that they stay in these jobs, and that they have that other that people have the services they need. So first, I'm just going to start by noting that there is 
is a growing awareness that there's a mismatch between home-based care policies and policies governing workers. Dr. Lisa Izioni and her team wrote a wonderful piece in 2019 about um, highlighting some of the tensions between consumer choice and control and workers' rights, with both of these groups um, being marginalized in the process. I also am probably preaching to the choir, so I'll just say, if you know one Medicaid waiver program, you know one Medicaid waiver program, right? We have patchwork of local, state, and federal funding policies that are complicated and vary from locale to locale. Um, and finally, as Catherine stated, I'm going to do my best to keep our eye on rural aspects of the issue and our research. And so historically, uh, the disability rights and workers' rights movements, um, related advocacy and policymaking have been very urban centric, just meaning that they've privileged the voices of um, and the needs of urban people uh, more than the needs of rural people. And some of the needs, of course, are the same, but living rurally does present some differences that need to be addressed. For instance, uh, one of those being that those who need care and the workers who provide the care are not evenly distributed across the country. And in this paper we wrote with Susan Chapman and other folks at Health Force Center at UCSF, we found that self-care disability and the presence of workers varies across geography and that the ratio of need to workers is higher in rural America and in the South. So in this next slide, you can see in this map, um, for example, you can see that uh, in much of the South, there's between zero and 95 workers per 1,000 people who identified as having a self-care disability, um, which means there are fewer workers per people who need, who could need assistance. Um, while uh, you can see in the blue, so that's in red, and in the blue is where there's higher numbers of workers um, per 1,000 people with self-care disabilities in places like Alaska in the West and the Northeast. Next slide. So as part of this project, we also um, wanted to elevate the voices of rural workers. And so we uh, used photo mapping methods with seven folks um, personal care attendants in five states between 2019 and 2020. And um, we asked them to take some pictures and then tell us why they were meaningful to their work. And we recorded those interviews and coded them. And these are just a couple of snippets of the themes that came. We've changed the names of the folks who participated. Um, all were women. Uh, this first photo is of a, of a two children with special health care needs um, and Alice who is their paid caregiver and also parent talks about um, in rural Wisconsin she says we're here we're oh and about rural resources and also rural resiliency so lack of resources but rural resiliency we're here we're alone and we are loving our families and loving our care and the people we care about with a lot of holes a lot of blessings and a lot of holes and they can forget we're out here. But I also think that it's not just rural caregivers. I think that in rural play areas with disabilities, we are very much forgotten. And then in terms of the meaningfulness of this work, Jody in rural Alaska, who shares a birthday with uh, one of the people she works with, will shared a photo of a birthday cake they were sharing. And she says, I guess I would just say there's always going to be boxes that have to be checked, but I think we can realize that there's more than that. It's a human connection, more than just checking boxes. And then a third theme uh, around community participation and how critical these services are to make sure that people can live and be in community and uh, Jennifer in rural Arkansas was sharing uh, this photo of a little uh, grocery store, she says, that's shopping, the finest shopping we have around here. It's about the only outing that she gets to do besides church. So, um, and then finally, this piece about relational work of rural caregiving, which again, not all of these are unique to uh, rural places, but some, they may be more important or be viewed differently. So this photo of a uh, home with a rainbow in the back and Sarah in rural Northern California shared um, 
I'm glad that there's this program so that you know that they can get the help they need and the love they need and the care they need. It's just in me. I think I was just born to do this. And so highlighting um, the that piece of what who are the workers and what are their kind of perspectives. There's a story map related to this that we will share um, that you can view later. Next slide. Um, so I'm not going to belabor this one because I, I find it uh, more boring. Uh, we did do a we did do a survey though of um, of. Uh, uh, to do an urban rural comparison of low income primarily Medicaid sample of consumers that um, consumer direct care network um, helped us recruit and um, and what we found is that there's not a ton of differences between rural consumers and urban consumers, especially in this low income uh, mostly Medicaid um, consumers, but looking at, um, we did find they were more likely to be white, more likely to be self-directed, had lower rates of difficulty dressing and bathing, compare, but also much higher rates of difficulty for running with running errands. Um, and so, uh, and reported a total of fewer disabilities. But so we took all that information and we said, okay, well, let's look next slide. Um, let's look at the qualitative pieces. And this was all guided by an advisory board of um, consumers and service providers. And we did some qualitative interviews with um, 38 folks. And what we found is that they did identify, these are rural consumers, um, some barriers and opportunities related to living in rural places. No one is probably surprised that transportation and distance to services was a, a big one, um, as well, uh, you know, having to use your hours to get to appointments and things, and then you don't have hours for other uh, needs. There's fewer local workers um, having difficulties with sharing workers and not having any backups, and that there's fewer services, especially accessible ones um, that are local. But they also identified some um, positive aspects of living rurally that made it easier for them to have services in terms of having positive relationships with um, folks in their town, feeling like they're in a tight knit community, um, and that people watch out for each other so they felt like they could trust people when they um, had referrals. Uh, there's um, more recreation op opportunities and that that value was important and having that connection to land and to nature and um, more affordable housing in some cases and also this idea of a slower pace of life. And this paper is in progress and being led by my colleague uh, Chris Stanley. Next slide, this is my last one <laughs> before. Uh, so I just want to highlight the concept that, that as um, Catherine pointed out earlier too, the consequences of going without services is dire. We have people who don't have um, housekeeping for weeks. We have people who um, go without meal and food preparation. And this is in a study that we did um, you analyzing 108 open-ended comments in a wave of the National Study of Health and Disability. And um, while it was COVID specific, uh, this, this quote really highlights that um, by Lee, a 49-year-old mother of two with um, a disabling chronic illness, says, uh, you know, this, this isn't a new problem. COVID has made a bad situation worse. It didn't break a well-oiled machine. It just sank the already sinking ship a little further under. So um, now... So that's that's the snapshot of kind of where we've been and, and the folks that we've talked to. And now we want to switch gears to our panelists and their lived experiences related to finding or recommending solutions for building and maintaining a supply of high quality, reliable workers in rural places. Um, and from the consumer, the worker and the systems perspective, and um, we'll spend about eight to 10 minutes per uh, dyad and um and we'll first start with uh chris and greg thanks Whew.
Chris and Greg, you'll need to unmute yourselves at the bottom or hit star six if you're on the phone. All righty then. Um, not quite sure why it wants to do this, but anyway, um, I am Chris Gaspari and I am from central Nebraska. Um, one of the things that Oh, Chris, you muted. You got muted again. Testing one, two, no. I'm here. Okay, so you got me now? Yep. Okay. Um, let's see, where was I? Um, I am from central Nebraska, and um, luckily I live in a larger community here that um, we've got some really great services, some really great agencies, but there is the deficit that um, is very glaring when it comes to um, finding workers and keeping them. Because when you can go down to the local McDonald's and make three or four or five dollars an hour more than coming in and working with an individual, a lot of people are going to take that three, four or five dollars an hour more. That's a big barrier for finding and keeping people, good people employed. Um, you know, when we talk about um, the finding of people, we've got agencies here like the League of Human Dignity and, and a few others that assist with that. And I'm so grateful for those, those folks. Um, but it's there's so few companies that provide that care out in rural Nebraska. The farther west you go, the worse it is. Um, and to find somebody and then to keep them with the amount of money that that's uh, you know provided is is really difficult. Um, I don't know, insurance is, is an issue. I've switched from a couple of different companies to this one that I'm with now. And this company is a lot different to me because um, not only do I you know, hear from and see my, my provider, but her boss comes in and if she's ill, Chris, do you need me to come in? Do you need anything? And then if that person isn't available, her boss comes in and says, what can we do? Do you need help? That is really reassuring because where I've been in the past, um, I've been without when I came home from the hospital after having COVID last year, I came home without a provider. And that's a very scary place to be when you're ill um you've been ill for a long time and you don't know if you're going to be able to get up and go to the restroom or or get um you know something to eat yourself or what have you um that's a really that's a scary place to be and um a lot of people get trapped in that as well they they stay in their homes and they isolate and don't think they need any assistance because they don't go out and they don't go um, to do anything for themselves. Um, you know, uh, the word of mouth is such a big thing because if I find somebody that's good or a company that's good, by gosh, I'm going to tell other people that I know that are in my situation. And if you can have that good working relationship with the people that you go through, your agencies or or um, other disability resources and talk to people, communicate, communicate the needs that you see around you as well as ones that you're going through. That is going to be what helps us 
to move forward and what helps us to, you know, say, hey, this, this is not acceptable. We need to move in this direction. And, um, you know, having those, those um, agencies, those service coordinators and things that are able to help us when it comes to making decisions about our health, making decisions about coming in and having someone work with you. And, um, you know, do you trust somebody enough to take and, you know, go run errands for you if you're not able to right then? Those are the things, you know, that are really, really important. You have to have the trust, you have to have the um, ability to communicate so that you know where you guys are at, you know where you're sitting at, where your provider is at, and getting out there and just being able to get the word out that there are services. So many don't even know that these services exist. You know, um, I, I could go on and on. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I really... And, and very grateful to have been able to be a part of this. And, you know, um, Greg from Wisconsin, he's got a setup that is fabulous. And I still want to copy him, you know, mm. because it works and you can see it works. And so, you know, dear Greg, I'm going to be copying you, except for the, you know, put your wife as a superwoman thing, but you know <laughs> so greg here i'm going to pass it off to you i guess um i'm from northern wisconsin basically and uh um up here the people seem to be a little maybe maybe friendlier as far as getting you can talk to you can approach people you can talk to people um mm -hmm. i've had really good luck with with getting my own people um, I mean, we, my wife and I pretty much uh, recruit, you know, no matter where we're at, if we, you know, somebody be talking to somebody, oh, my daughter is doing this or whatever is, well, really, does she maybe want to do something on the side, you know? Um, and we've had really good luck doing that. Um, I, I guess I hate to say it, but I almost got to get sick to get people because we, you know, we do it in. When I'm in the hospital, we're always recruiting, uh, um, mm -hmm. emergency room. Uh, you know, it's it's a. Uh, in fact, I have a couple yet that have been with me like six, seven years already, and um, that's how we recruited them was through that system. Um, mm -hmm. I guess I'm not that bad a person. Maybe I don't know. That's a no. <laughs> um, we. Uh, my wife just went. Um, as far as treating them, treating the people, I mean, we treat them. I mean, they're appreciated, and we tell them that all the time, you know. And, and we yeah. tell them they're doing us a favor by coming here. Um, we always, if we're talking to them, hey, why don't you come over someday and just see what's going on? You know, what you'd have to do, and and. Uh, you know, they'll come over and, and and we tell encourage them to bring you know boyfriends husbands parents whoever you know just to show them that it's you know not a, it's a legit thing um as far as equipped my house is really well set up um i have an overhead lift that takes you through the house um uh, walk walk in roll in shower that's like five feet by six feet um you know the bathroom was completely redone for for you know getting under the sink and whatever else um you know so that doesn't hurt either um Chris, so we got about one more minute before we've got to close up and move on to the next question yeah um as far as uh with the with the girls that we do get i mean i always tell them you know if you can't come here with a smile and, and a sense of humor don't come um you know so they kind of they come in here pretty pretty uh you know relaxed already i guess from that standpoint um 
-hmm. and we and we don't we don't uh you know if there's a problem we always try to have them involved with helping solve it um you know make it a team thing instead of just us saying hey we're going to do it this way and that's it um so I, um you know and that's always pretty well received that way uh lacey anna's mm -hmm. on here i think she's one of my girls and i've had her for i think six or seven years now and um maybe she can give you some I, yeah. her i don't really joke or play tricks on too much but um <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> Yeah, this is great. It's just a nice, Greg, nice segue to yeah. the to the mm -hmm. next one. Um, so Lacey Ann and Simone um, was going to be on with us today, uh, but she is in Northern California and she reached out yesterday and I'm a little worried that there's no electricity where she's at at this point. Mm. So uh, Lacey Ann is is with us to provide some worker perspective on um, what makes it easier for you to get personal care aid jobs and stay in them. Um, and so if you want to talk to that or. Um, sure. Um, with my experience, I'm like, I love my job. I don't know if it's because it's Greggy it makes it so easy for me, but it's been a delight helping out. And I am like super dedicated because I know that Greg and Lisa are depending on me to show up to work or even to help out when the other girls can't, which it is good that we have this new scheduling system because it shows me like if somebody um, filled in for that day or if it's a day that I can go in a little bit later because I do have a full-time job. So the scheduling system that they have is like working out super good for us this year. And as far as it going to um, other in-home aid jobs, I haven't had any since then because technically I don't really want it to interfere with my time helping out Greg and Lisa because I've been offered to help other person, but th that's not something I could do full time and maintain um, insurance all that, and all of that thing since I'm a single mom. So I basically just do that on the side and be there for Greg and Lisa because now they're like literally family. <laughs> yeah it's it's interesting you're speaking to that that piece of um hello <laughs> that piece of the relationship and having those good personal relationships and also highlighting that um what i've seen in the chat of the the lack of benefits so even if you were to piece together a, a string of clients including greg you need a different job in order to have those those benefits um if yes. Simone were here, oh, sorry. Oh, and one more thing. I know they do offer OML through the healthcare system that we live in. The Aspira system does offer in home. But my perspective on that is that you don't get to really build a relationship with your clients because your clients are changing so often you really don't know. Because now I have a routine with Greg. When I go in, I do this, I do that, and then we move on from there. But if I'm working for like an organization, it would be 10 different clients every now and then I'll see this person, then don't see this person are filling here and there, which I don't really like that because then you can't develop a, like a personal relationship and let that person feel comfortable. Because working in healthcare, I know sometimes persons do get like offended being that I'm younger and I have to assist them with daily ADLs, but, at the end of the day, I just want them to feel comfortable knowing that they'll have somebody that respect their privacy and all of that stuff so that we can develop a relationship where they can come to me and ask any any simple task that they want to want me to do. I don't have a problem with doing that. Yeah, great. Thank you, Lysiane. Um And I will just only add just a little bit about Simone's perspective from California. She's a, a member of a union um, and that, you know, has been beneficial in, um, you know, feeling like it's, she's valued and um, there's better pay and, um, and supported in her, in her role. 
in that. So I think we can switch to systems perspectives now. So what systems level factors can we change to increase the supply of workers in rural places? And to speak to this is uh, Jane and Jeff. Did I go first? I'm like... Yeah, go ahead, Jane. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Jane Johnson, and I'm the executive director of the association that represents Centers for Independent Living in Florida. And we do have quite a few areas of our state that are rural. So um, I know our Centers for Independent Living hear from consumers all the time about the difficulty, although um, it's this is obviously not just a rural problem. It's an urban problem as well. And I wanted to talk to you about a couple of different ways of looking at how to solve this problem beyond um, advocating for doing the right thing, because um, we've been doing that for decades. Personal assistance services reimbursement from traditional sources like Medicare and Medicaid have been too long, too low for too long. Um, and they often get caught up in um, looked at as a, as a typical wage um, and compared to, to the same salary someone would make for an eight hour day. Um, but most personal assistance um, don't work a full eight hour day with one person. They usually come in for one to two hours and then move on to someone else if they have another person that they work with. So looking at the hourly rate as if it's um, comparable to an eight hour day hourly rate is, is not a realistic construct. So one of the first things I would recommend is that um, in trying to look at how the systems can be changed and leveraged is to change the way you look at this as an occupation because it's not an um, it's not like a an hourly wage earner um, rate and so but because of that people would need to earn more per hour to, to make it a reasonable uh, career choice for themselves. But I know in, um, in in any kind of health and human services work, you get what you incentivize, and rather than advocating for what's right, sometimes you need to figure out well how can we incentivize both the payers and the pool of workers to come into this field and fill this gap. And for the payers, um, in many states on the Medicaid side, those have become managed care organizations. And those are large publicly traded corporations who answer to their shareholders in terms of um, how much profit they can earn for the company. And so trying to make the argument to change the way that personal assistance services are reimbursed by Medicaid or Medicare, if, if a managed care organization is administering that program. Um, I think it's important to take a look at the, the aggregate cost of caring for someone who's not getting the personal assistance services that they, re, they rely upon to live in the community. And for many people, that would mean living in a more expensive setting, like an assisted living facility or a nursing home, or potentially having a preventable hospital stay. And so if you can, make the fiscal argument um, and actually show the data, you use the numbers, that map that was shown was is, um, a really great example of how you can take data and present it um, to make a credible and compelling argument to support what you're saying. But um, CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services and the Administration for Community Living have for the past several years really encouraged states to look at something called value-based purchasing or uh, bundled rates where you don't reimburse, um, the, where the, the federal payer system, systems don't reimburse based on a per service basis. You, you take an outcome and you bundle a, a package of services needed to produce that outcome and you come up with what's called a bundled rate or a case rate. And bundled into that could be the rate for personal assistance services. And by putting it into one large rate, it would give the ability to pay more for personal assistance services than the Medicaid program would currently authorize or advertise. So um, it's complicated, but it's doable. And a lot of states have made a lot of progress on there. There are a lot of people who have studied this issue for a long time, but I that would be my first recommendation is to, um, you've got to incentivize the work and you've got to incentivize the payers to want to pay more for the work. And to do that, you need to look differently at the payer systems and, um, and realize take advantage of the flexibilities that come with managed care. Um, for a long time, um, people with disabilities have shuddered at the idea of managed care because it, it um, I think people associate it with less services and managed care means less care, managed care means limitations. And it doesn't have to mean that because you can work within those systems to get a better outcome uh, by um, using some of the creativity that's allowed 
in a managed care system um, in combination with a Medicaid waiver program. Medicaid waivers are exactly what they sound like. They're It's a waiver of the traditional state plan requirements for Medicaid that gives allows states to be more flexible to provide a package of services that some of which are medical and some of which are non-medical, um, addressing some of the social determinants of health. Um, another thing that you can leverage is the fact that managed care organizations that deliver Medicare and Medicaid services are required to have a, an adequate provider network to serve the consumers that are enrolled in their plans. And if they don't have enough personal assistance services providers in their network, then they are in violation of their contract. And um, advocates and consumers should be aware of that and know how to work with your state Medicaid agency to make sure that if someone is living in a rural area and they are receiving home and community community based services funded by Medicaid, but there are no providers, then that that Medicaid managed care organization should not be receiving a monthly per diem for those services because they can't deliver them. And that that is a contractual requirement. So I think you can leverage that to you don't want to get punitive because then you kind of destroy the relationship that you need um, with with the with the organization paying for those services but it's an opportunity to bring them to the table to talk about how what you can do to try to um try to incentivize more personal assistance services some of the things that managed care organizations can do with the flexibilities that waiver services allow things like paying for um a broadband services so that a person can have access to the internet, reliable access to the internet. They can pay for transportation, possibly Uber services for the PCA. Um, different, um, identifying what some of the barriers are to getting personal assistance services to a person in a rural area when working with the managed care organization to try to get those, those barriers mitigated or addressed. Um, and then also on the PCA side, they've got, they have their barriers. As I said, transportation is one, and you can talk to the managed care organization about um, bus passes, Uber, Uber passes. Um, and then also um, working with your center for independent living that serves those, those areas um, to talk to the PCAs about benefits assistance counseling. As several comments were made about the lack of benefits for someone who provides personal assistance services. Well, with the Affordable Care Act, there is insurance available that people can access. There's also other public benefits programs that unfortunately, because of the low income that some personal assistance um, receive, they may be eligible for, but aren't aware of. And so um, leverage the, the existing infrastructure that's out there to serve people with disabilities um, by having the, the consumer with a disability call a center for independent living and, and get in information about benefits assistance that their PCA may qualify for to help make that PCA whole, to help fill the, the financial gaps that that person may have so that working, providing the personal assistance services is something that's more reasonable and more realistic for them. Another Amy, thing, I think, oh, Jane, I was going to say, I think that's a great segue to Jeff, who is uh, at a Center for Independent Living in Oklahoma and thinking about that systems level. <laughs> well, thanks. And, and you know, I agree so much with what Jane said. And um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on one's perspective, you know, there are many states that aren't covered by Medicaid managed care companies. And Oftentimes, those comp those states, their Medicaid agency is the problem, and so same strategies could apply. Um, except I don't the, you know, it does get a little bit more punitive when, um, when it is your Medicaid agency, and they have said that they're going to create these infrastructures for additional personal care into personal care providers, yet don't. And we've seen here uh, many times where uh, people have gone a significant amount of time without the supports necessary, and people have died um, many, many, many times. And that was a result of our Medicaid agency, period. So the way you know things are here right now, um, it is like a breath of fresh air to have um, an MCO coming in or a couple or three, however many 
that are going to be here and to work with people with disabilities to make it a priority to address these ongoing challenges that um, people with disabilities continue to have transportation social determinants of health housing in particular um, health care personal care assistance all of those types of scenarios that has been left to the state and under the medicaid waiver programs and state entities that are created for other purposes even though they receive funding for these services so it's really interesting dynamic when um, those types of issues occur and during covid as we all just um, are buckling down for what well, seems to be another round of stuff um, here there was everything i mean like many other places everything was shut down um, there was not uh, masks there was not personal care uh, attendance there was not anything getting to our community and that was left to the centers thankfully um, you know we were part of that uh, stimulus money and we were able to get additional resources to our communities to help with that personal care model um, to get personal care aids into the communities to get PPE into the communities um, whereas nobody else was out here doing it everything was shut down there was nobody um, transportation wasn't running it was left up to us and so it got me thinking okay you know, of course, we partnered. Um, I'm not going to say that we did not partner with MCOs because we did. Um, and it was fantastic. It really provided some really good resources for us uh, to get additional supports when it was when we really needed it. So in, a, in addition to all the other Medicaid, the, the Medicaid concepts and programs that are already available, you know, what does really need to happen to address the ongoing needs? Obviously, it's going to be the pay. Obviously, it's going to be the health the healthcare or benefits that a person gets, um, a career ladder, or possibly even um, you know, forming a union. But is there stopgap measures or is there something in addition to that that needs to also take place? And yeah, I think that there is. Um, the if, if everything continues to be tied to the state and the state is part of the problem, then where does do we decouple ourselves from um, having to enter into a contractual agreement with a particular state entity in order to provide good personal care services for somebody moving from an institutional setting, for instance, somebody within a foster care system, for instance, where the state has just left people. And it is, um, these issues are often politicized and um, people just go without. So, you know, that we have talked uh, with the National Council of Independent Living, we have been talking pretty, um, a great deal around creating additional funding streams and to support um, the existing funding streams as well. So if we have another um, amount of money like we did with the stimulus to where we can, the centers can utilize that to support people with disabilities when in emergency settings or on weekends or uh, helping people move from institutional settings and then um, or people who are homeless, um, then we don't see um, all of this political mess as much and people going without uh, we don't see that nearly as much and so i'm hoping and planning that we will see some effort going into that in addition to i do feel like with the medicaid managed care that this is a um a large area a big area where uh, we do need to capitalize there are some really good um, mcos um, there are some that aren't so good um, but it is up to us as people with disabilities to help those um, other MCOs come along, provide better education to them, training, support, whatever it is. Because if that's the direction that all of this, the healthcare systems are going to go in the next um, 10 to 20 years, then they're here for a while. 
And finally, the um, health disparities and that we have within different populations and where people live, um, you know, that is something that our state in particular has just been um, awful at. And this is yet one more aspect of things where I think MCOs could be um, really helpful. And the final piece that I'll talk about here is um, for way too long, the uh, social determinants of health related to housing, access, transportation, healthcare, all of that stuff has just been kind of ignored. Um, we have these programs and requirements that have been that are supposed to have been created and should be enforced related. I'm just going to talk about housing, that there should be a significant amount of, of enforcement around housing and the accessibility thereof. And unfortunately, what happens all too often here is that a, a caseworker, case manager, social worker, whatever you want to call them, um, you know, they'll help somebody get into a home or an apartment that may not be accessible to their needs, and then they'll just try and patch um, the support around the inaccessibility component of the home, such as um, not having a place where a person who uses a wheelchair can um, independently cook or clean or uh, get into the bathroom or whatever and then utilize that personal care aid to, to support that person from that point on. And when we see these systems break down like this, then that individual is also, um, is so much more at risk. And obviously we've all seen too many people that have gone into nursing homes or other institutions or um, hospitals because of not being able to properly live independently. So that is also that also means that we have to in, ensure that we are enforcing these rules, enforcing the fact that these homes, co apartment complexes, housing units that are constructed for people for accessibility purposes, they must be. Um, constructed in the proper way so that people can independently um, cook, clean, do whatever it is that they want. And then from that point on, if they need additional personal assistance services and support it that way, but not in a way um, to just get somebody into a home that doesn't address their needs, because then, of course, we have all these other factors that come into play. Jeff, that is that is such a great segue into the next part of which is what you just summarized how um, one factor accessible housing uh, makes it so that you don't need as many services or the, the types of services you need are different so now we're going to shift we want to make sure we have enough time for questions. So we're on a 20 minute, we've, we've gone over surprise. We all have a lot to say. <laughs> um, and we're gonna, so we have 20 minutes um, to talk about decreasing demand. So um, we'll start with Greg and Chris again, and just talking about um, building on what Jeff has talked about, factors that influence your need for services and um, home modifications was something that came up a lot. <laughs> and you'll both need to unmute again, uh, click in the corner or star six if you're on the phone. Okay, can you hear me? <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, one of the big things that Jeff brought up, the home modifications and accessibility and such, I was on a waiting list here um, in Nebraska for three years to get an accessible apartment. Now, our agency, the housing agency here, works with a lot of folks with disabilities. There's Oh, I think there's 20 units here out of 100 that are accessible. Um, 
which I'm very grateful for. And I waited because I had an apartment that I could go in my wheelchair, go into my living room, and that's as far as I could get. Um, otherwise, it was not accessible. And I lived there for 11 years. Um, when I first moved in in a- last April here into my accessible apartment, I went into every room, including the pantry, and I bawled. I cried because I could ex- have total access to my entire apartment. And a lot of people have no idea how that feels, but imagine being to where you could only walk, go into your living room, but not any of the other rooms in your house and to get in and out easy. It's, it's a huge thing. And it's, it's also a thing of um, safety and, you know, being able to um, maintain um, a healthy entrance and things for like when I went to the hospital with COVID, you know, that it was, they could not get the, the stretchers in. <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot of different issues there. Home modifications, assistive technology partnership here in Nebraska, um, I know does an amazing amount of work with that. And they do home modifications and vehicle modifications and all sorts of things. A lot of people have no idea they exist. They're, you know, they're doing a lot of um, com- commercials and things like that now, which is wonderful. But agencies have to work together too, you know, to say, hey, okay, our agency doesn't cover this, but this agency over here really works well with folks. So let me get you in touch with them. Let me help you fill out the paperwork, whatever the case may be, because the more the agencies work together, you know, it, it all trickles down. You know, the agencies working together, the, the agencies paying for the uh, personal assistance, the whole nine yards, it all works together. And um, we have to make sure that we take some of that advocacy back, especially as people with disabilities, and make sure folks know that, hey, we need more affordable housing in our area. We don't have it. Go and get <laughs> get mouthy. You know, be to where you are visible in your community and with, like, your um, town councils and things like that. Don't don't stop, you know, waving your hand and saying, hey, I'm here, because every single person deserves that opportunity to live the best life that we can. And, you know, I have to say this, the other night with all of our ice and snow that we had here, we have the only store I can get to with my wheelchair, um, (laughs) did not want to clear their sidewalks. So I was out in the middle of a four-lane street which is not a good street to be out in the middle of anyway. <laughs> so, you know, I asked them who their, their snow removal people were. They said, oh, well, that's the city's responsibility. No, guess what? We have to take responsibility. Everybody does. And so they'll, they're getting a letter from the city to make sure that they understand what their responsibility is. We need to let each other know what's our responsibility. Build from there. You know, so I will shut up and let Greg come in. <laughs> Hello, Greg. Hi. I guess, uh, <laughs> you know, the whole modification thing is I can see where that's a, you know, a big thing. I mean, for us, it is, you know, just to be able to get around everywhere in the house. And um, I mean, I get outside and it's a whole different story sometimes, but, you know get stuck in a garden hose once in a while or something, you know, (laughs) Um, but the ambulance ambulance now, if, if I get the light, my, with this lift thing that I have in my house, they don't even come in the house anymore. My wife brings me to the door, drops me on their lift and away we go, you know? Um, I mean, I, I know it's, it's an ideal setup for me. I mean, and I realize other people don't have it. Uh, I mean, even getting like a, an outside ramp or whatever is tough to do sometimes for people. And um, 
there is a church in our town that helps people, you know, they build them for people, but they can only handle so many of them too. Um, I, I mean, like I say, we've, I've got a, you know, a porch lift or whatever, you know, it takes you up and, you know, lifts you up and down. And um, like I say, they were, they've, they've been good to me. And I guess the big thing to tell people, if you don't, if you don't ask you, you're not going to know, um, you know, you, you just, I guess if you, you know, I mean, I asked for some of this stuff and it was like, yeah, we can do that. But if you don't ask, they don't do it either. Um, so I guess, like I say, we've, we've had it, had it good that way. And um, I don't know. I, yeah. As far as services, um, I, we're down and this is kind of off the subject, but um my van broke down out of town and um you know try to find a ride home at six o'clock at night you know um we finally found a guy a private person you know just to drive me home it cost me a hundred bucks too you know and uh but like i say that you, you call these taxi places oh yeah we we have a van but it's not available till tomorrow um um how much does your chair weigh how much do you weigh? Well, if it's over 500 pounds, they won't come and get you anyway. Um, you know, there's a lot of education, I think, that needs to be be done that way, too, with people or with like some of these, you know, bus services or whatever that, you know, why aren't they ordered heavy enough to handle this kind of stuff, I guess. Um, I'm so sorry. I, yeah. Um, that's that's my big pet peeve, I guess. Is some kind of you know the outside of the house more than you know, like the sidewalks, like you referenced, with snow and ice on them. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of them you, you just drive on the street all winter; it doesn't even pay to try to go down them. Um, so. Yeah, that's so. Those are super. Yeah, the the you and your your lift system in your home was. Um, funded through the partnership with the with the, well, the, the state manage yeah the state and the and the managed care organization and then wisconsin yeah. and so but then now we need more for the for the outside <laughs> and more yeah because yeah, people want to well let's switch gears to the worker perspectives and simone thank you so much for joining us <laughs> You know, oh, you're don't. welcome. I'm sorry. We have a we had a technician here for our heating and cooling. It completely broke, and so we have to get um, a new unit. <laughs> fun, oh, fun, fun. I'm so glad you're here and that you're safe-ish. It sounds like from the storms at this oh, point. Oh, yeah, we're up. Hot. We're up in the woods, sort of. Not the woods. Trees. We're in the trees. Okay. So we're we're up high enough. The flood won't get us unless we need to drive somewhere. Then we might be in trouble. But yeah, <laughs> thank you for having me. Well, yeah, and I don't know if if you feel is it okay if I just put you on the spot to talk a little bit about what factors improve your ability to provide high quality services and some of the we talked about home accessible things and you and Lacey can spend about five minutes talking about about that okay that's fine yeah yeah do you want to go first or do you want Lacey Ann to go um, first well let me see here um we'll go ahead and have Lacey go first okay so with the accessibility it's been working out so far great because when I first started Greg already have his lift so it was just basically learning how to operate the lift and as far as anything that is needed within the household for us to do our job on a daily basis, um, we just have to tell him and make sure that next time when we go in, um, that's available. So it's basically just the communication between me and him. And one thing I wanna point out is that it's, I would take on more clients if there was like a organization or a program that we could join so that way we can get the benefits and all of that that comes with the job. So you can, you know, be more, because 
with doing health care, it makes it it's like fulfilling my need for <laughs> helping persons. Even though I have kids, it is really, really uplifting for me. Like I know when I go there and Greg is smiling and he has all his stuff done on time and he's out the door to like enjoy his day outside. That's been that would be like such a pleasure doing that all day. But as I said, if they could enforce our coming with a program that would help us to gain more clients where we could like, even pay for our own insurance, that would even be better. Yeah. Thanks, Lisa. Okay. Well, um, I live in uh, Lake County in California and we are actually the second poorest county in California. We used to be first. I don't know who's more poor than we are, but um, anyway, um, we don't have a lot of, um, well, how do I put this? Um, so through our public authority, the IHSS program, we are not provided with uh, much assistance from the county itself. Uh, like when the pandemic first hit, uh, we were responsible for providing our own gloves, our own mask, um, sanitizers and things like that. Um, so uh, we were kind of limited. Um, right now, I'm just taking care of my daughter who is autistic and I don't have to do a lot because she lives with me, but uh, my previous uh, client, um, mm, he has a piece of work. I. <laughs> Um, anyway, the place that he lives in is, um, a senior living facility. It's not assisted living, but it's senior living. And the nice thing is that they do make the apartments, um, bigger, um, the showers are, you just walk into them. <clears throat> There's no tub to have to deal with lots of grab bars. Um, and I'm looking at the list safety. Yeah, it's it's relatively safe there, although anybody can come in and out during the day, uh, probably unnoticed by the staff. Uh, the Simone, the is, yes. Sorry, Simone, could you did you feel like that accessibility made it better better for you in terms of like avoiding injury? That's the kind of safety I think we were thinking. Of. Oh, OK. Um, well, yeah. Yeah, I would say I, I didn't have to do a lot of hands on with this particular uh, client. Um, but yeah, privacy, dignity, they, you know, they have that. I don't, um, are you talking about efficiency as far as where they live, what they have? Is this what we're talking about? Yeah, I think when we talked to, <laughs> about um, the privacy and dignity pieces, you were mentioning like, that um, even when people age in home, um, that as their health declines, they're not able, if they're not in an accessible home, they're yeah. not able to go like into the privacy of a bedroom because they're stuck in a bed in the dining room. Oh yeah, um, yeah. Those kinds of things. yeah. So, but with this, with this particular client, you know, he, he had his own little apartment and his bed was in his bedroom. Um, the ability to spend more time on meaningful activities. Um, wasn't a whole lot of that going on. I mostly just took him to his appointments. And I think I told you before, he was extremely um, messy. And uh, at one point he was, this is terrible to say, but he was using, uh, you know, the adult diapers and he would just take them off and he'd just leave them where they, where they sat, you know? Um, yeah, so it sounds like um, really challenging. Um, very, it was very for, challenging for probably both of you. Yeah, and he's he never reported to public authority, so he's still on my payroll, mm -hmm. and um, I, I need to call them and you know take care of this because I don't know what he's. I'm not going to go back. Um, it know, sounds it's like it's, uh, it's oh, I, I, situations where I think a male provider would be best for this man mm -hmm. i i think um it's i mean women are are great they're they're usually the best providers but when we're talking about a man who has bowel issues and mm -hmm. urine issues 
um, I think um, him having a man would be a better thing. Well, and it, uh, it sounds like, I mean, that kind of speaks to some of the systems um, issues of what does the supply of workers look like. Yes. Um, and I think this is a good time to switch. We got about five minutes before we do some questions with uh, Jeff and Jane <laughs> um, in terms of policy changes or um, just building on what you've talked about before as well. Would be great. And you'll need to unmute again. So hit the button in the corner or hit star six if you're on the phone. Sorry about that. This is Jane Johnson again. And I want to just put in a plug for Centers for Independent Living. This is something that's housing and accessibility is are, um, a, a topic, a, a top priority for all of them, at least here in Florida that I'm personally aware of. And they all work with local um, housing agencies and, um, and city and state governments to get funding to do home modifications. Um, ramps, grab bars, accessible bathrooms, kitchens, and that sort of thing. So um, again, I, we have a, 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 a sort of a statewide infrastructure, like a, um, a highway system of, of independent living services in the Centers for Independent Living. They're federally funded and they are invaluable assets in the community. So if um, folks aren't already tapping into them, I would say that you need to do that. The second one is a little bit non-traditional, but AARP, the American Association of Retired Persons, has made livable communities a priority for them. It's a legislative priority. They work, um, unfortunately, oh, Fortunately or unfortunately, seniors have a lot of political clout, way more so than people with disabilities. They get the, the attention of legislators for a variety of reasons. It doesn't matter why, and it doesn't matter that that's it's that there's, there's inequity, but what matters is there's an opportunity to kind of jump on those coattails and ride that wave of political clout for the issues that you sh that people with disabilities share um, as priorities with people who are who are trying to age in place in their homes who are elderly. So um, there's a lot of different um, priorities. If you go to the AARP website and look at what matters to those to their members, it's a lot of the things that matter to people with disabilities. So I would say leveraging those funds um, for non-elderly people with disabilities so that we can tap into that, um, to those resources. Um, state universities also have rehab engineering schools and departments. And I was on the phone with one of them um, two weeks ago and they will take on projects. So that's another source to get um, home modifications done by rehab engineering students from a non-traditional source that doesn't rely on a waiting, a HUD waiting list or a, a housing services waiting list. And then the other thing I would really recommend is working with your state assistive technology program to identify smart technologies that you can integrate into a home to automate functions um, and reduce the need for personal care assistance, like medication reminders, um, automatic door openers, different ways that you can um, make things, uh, automate things in the home that a person would normally rely upon a personal care assistant for. And then finally, um, segregating out those duties that are personal care versus um, custodial or housekeeping, and maybe um, dividing up that labor. The person who's going to prepare your meals and do some things in the kitchen and, and housekeeping is, doesn't have to have the same skill set as a person who's going to provide your very you know, intimate personal care. And so you may want to divide up that labor um, and, and you know, figure out how you might be able to get both of those things done um, more effectively, um, but, but using the personal care assistant only for that very personal care. And then maybe having a friend, a neighbor, a volunteer, retired educators um, do some of the more, um, the, the housekeeping type stuff. Okay, that, I'm done. Is that too much? <laughs> That's great, thanks. Go ahead, Jeff. That was excellent, thank you. The so I'll tell you the story here. Um, we there was this uh, person that was on my board for many many years, and she has she had cerebral palsy, and uh, for many many years she was um, the city, which is another the city of um, a lot of uh, rural and um, urban areas have access to community development block grant funds and CDBG funds. And a push portion of those can be used for home mods to you know, make things fully accessible so that um, a person doesn't have to rely on personal care services as much. And, but years ago, this person was put in this 
uh, two bed two bedroom apartment and she couldn't use the kitchen she couldn't even hardly get into the kitchen her power chair was just too big um, and couldn't get into the bathroom very well I had used a track system from seemed like from her living room maybe from her bedroom over into the bathroom very small um not real appropriate place for her to be living and so about seven or eight years ago um, we put a lot of effort into trying to get her into her own place that was fully accessible so that she could um, the one thing she wanted to do was if you know, she cho so chose was to uh, do her dishes <laughs> god knows why um, so Anyway, we uh, put about $25,000 with um, the cooperation of the city into this one unit in the two bedroom apartment, fully accessible, very nice hardwood floors, every feature that you could possibly imagine um, where she could roll up underneath the sink, she could roll up underneath the stove, she could do just about everything independently. Um, Unfortunately, she died over the weekend, and um, you know that was one of those really good things that we wanted to see happen um, before she did pass on. Um, but at the same time, while that is a really good story in partnering with the our city of Norman, as money becomes less available as there are competing priorities with other populations uh, people with disabilities accessibility in general um, will often lose out um, to something or some other group that is popular at that particular point in time so cannot illustrate enough of the importance of being engaged and involved in making sure that we're utilizing everything that we possibly can um, to make our communities accessible, the livable communities, the uh, the buzzword this week or the buzzword next week, you know, it's always about a different population first. Um, so as long as you're staying engaged on these things and at all times and always raising the awareness, um, you know, it's it's never going to be easy. There's always going to be some type of significant change um you know every time i look at the social determinants of health i just get more and more frustrated over the fact that there hasn't been so much more to address the challenges around personal care services and um just access to health care access to any type of service in general um the other aspect of thing the policy wise is you know um, um medicaid buy-in how many states have a Medicaid buy-in that would allow for personal care assistance on the job? 1619B. How many states enforce the 1619B provision to allow for um, a person to earn what a higher wage and still retain their health care? That could include personal care assistance. Um, and there's not that many. I know that there are some consultants that are out there um, trying to you know, say they want to work with states. But uh, the reality is that, um, you know, there's not that many that really have some of these policies in place. And they are incredibly helpful to those of us that truly need them and could support um, a much higher level of personal care aids better wages, better um, benefits, um, mileage, and coordinating services in general. Um, I'm seeing, unfortunately, what we continue to see is a big push back towards the congregate living situations, even though we just went through all this mess with COVID. Um, and, you know, I'll be the first one to say that, you know, Oklahoma was one of the fools that gave um, so much more millions of dollars to the nursing home industry to help them better prepare what they were what they were supposed to be doing in the first place uh, which was supporting people so um 
I'm I think sorry that... to interrupt. We're at five minutes left, and we should probably get on to some questions. I apologize, Jeff. So I'm going to stop my rant right there. <laughs> I think we could do this for a three-hour session and still have plenty more to say. Well, um, thank you all. Uh, Jeff, will you do the next slide? And I won't, I'm not going to belabor this. I hope that this has all given us a lot of things to think about. Um, but I want to leave uh, just a few minutes. Sorry about that for questions. The key takeaways will be on the slides when we send them out. So whatever questions we have, now's the time. Yeah. Hi, so this is Lily. Um, I'm going to read some of the questions that we've had. There's been a really great conversation going on in the chat, and hopefully we can synthesize some of these and send them out as well. Um, early on, some folks did ask about getting um, the access to the map that Raina shared, and I'm going to put two links in the chat right now. Um, the first link is to the quantitative analysis that has that map that she sh shared. It's the story map. Um, I can link to the journal article too. And then the second one is a link to the qualitative story map um, where uh, uh, she also shared some photos and quotes from folks. Um, so I just wanted to get that out of the way first. And then we do have some questions from Eric uh, Peterson around what is the average Medicaid hourly rate for services such as home-based care and services. Um, and I want to just follow up on that, that folks then did, he also had a question around do caretakers get benefits in which there was a good rich discussion in the chat. And so we'll be able to answer that a little later. But if anyone does know about the hourly rate, you can either put that in the chat or unmute yourself and let us know. I know here in Nebraska, and I cannot say that this is a, a rate through Medicare or Medicaid, but um, two of my previous helpers, their pay rate was $12 an hour. Mm -hmm. And um, the, my helper now goes, she's through a different company and she makes 15 an hour. And I do think um, phiinternational.org, PHI, will somebody write that in the chat? Or I should, um, has some really good data as well as I think Catherine has some how it varies state to state about Medicaid reimbursement. And this is Jane Johnson in Florida and I'll just comment that this, the federal payers Medicare and Medicaid usually pay by the visit. It's not like an hourly rate it's kind of a misnomer um, and if you go through an agency then the agency will build a federal payer Medicare and Medicaid for 20 or $25 an hour, and then reimburse, they'll negotiate um, a visit rate with, with the workers, which is usually about half of what they receive. So to the extent that a person can hire someone directly through a consumer directed care option, it'll allow you to pay um, your, your workers more. Or um, in here in Florida, we have a program where we can reimburse people for their personal care assistance services if they are not on Medicaid. And so we see rates anywhere from $12 an hour to $25 an hour for people on that program, but they can receive up to $2,100 a month in a um, stipend from us for to help offset those costs that they're paying out of pocket. Thank you. And I know we just have one minute, so I don't know exactly how we want to proceed, but I do have another question just um, and maybe people could get connected in the chat from Maria in Colorado asking if anyone is working with any USDA rural development programs around accessibility, um, if anyone has experience in, uh, partnering with the USDA. Um, and maybe that would be a good way to put some info in the chat and get connected as well. Brian in Colorado, agribility. Great. Like ability in agriculture, agribility. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, that's a good program. I think yeah. South Carolina just got an agribility as well. Maybe some other. And ones. Florida did as well, which was the reason we had that conversation with the rehab engineers. So that's a great opportunity. Um, to, to not so much increase the supply of personal assistance, but to reduce the reliance um, through technology and automation. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, Nebraska has it as well. It's both supply and demand, right? Yeah. Well, this has been such a great conversation. Um, we will send out the slides. There are some additional um, uh, resources. And the National Council on Aging has just recently uh, has the, a direct care workforce capacity building center that is funded through NIDLER that we definitely people should keep an eye out um, for what they're doing. They've got some great partnerships. Um, and I just really thank everybody for coming. Jeff Gutierrez, do you have anything? Do we need to say anything else? Housekeeping? No, no more housekeeping. <laughs> Appreciate everybody's involvement. This was a fantastic session. <laughs> Thank you everyone for coming and sharing and your lived experiences. Really good. All right. Until, until tomorrow. Oh, we got a plug. We should plug the digital one is tomorrow. So <laughs> if you're not already signed up. Rural digital access tomorrow. Same back time, same back channel. Actually, <laughs> different back channel. <laughs> yeah. All right, folks. Thanks so much. Thanks, Thank you so much. Bye.